Uh, it's great to worship together and uh, be with all of you. Great to have you joining online. Always great to have you. If you're joining from another country or another state, let us know where you're watching from. Always love to connect with you, whether right now live or even later on in the week as you're watching. Great to have you guys in-house. We're continuing with our series, Emerge. Emerge, did you know that we, were, we witnessed some history this last week or so, the last 10 days or so? You guys remember? You guys aware of that? You guys remember this, uh, this, this little thing here called... Um, Ingenuity, the Mars, uh, Mar a Mars helicopter. Now, it looks pretty big here, but it's actually really small. Here's the video of, of what we saw. It, it's, it's way down here. This little guy right down here. Yeah, you see, this, was, uh, this happened this past week. It's only uh, four pounds is, is the weight of it. And this most amazing time, this was the record. It was on, on April 19th. It's the first powered controlled flight on another planet. And there you have it. This was considered to be one of the biggest accomplishments since the Wright brothers with their with airplane, right, and, and, and uh, flight and getting there. And then it was up, and you know how, you know what altitude it climbed to? It's unbelievable, 10 feet. <laughs> 10 feet, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like a whole lot. But then, but then they shattered the record of 10 feet on another planet this, with a second flight in the last uh, week. And you know, you know what it climbed to? 16 feet. <laughs> 16 feet, right? It doesn't seem like maybe a big deal, the small thing, but it is a huge deal to, to forge into, you know, into new territory, to take on this new reality. But you look at that and you say, how did this come to be? Somebody had a vision, somebody had a plan, a dream for it, and people came together and you go, who do we credit for this accomplishment? What's the engineer that, that did this? What's her name? Who is she? Who's the, the rocket scientist that made this happen? Who do we credit for this? Well, here's the, the Mars 2020 team. Take a look. Here's who we credit. Can you, pick up, can you pick out the person that made this happen? <laughs> right, it takes a lot of people to do something great, to accomplish great visions, to accomplish great dreams. It's not just one person. It's everyone doing their part and working together. So today, as we continue, uh, we're gonna be in part three of our Emerge series, and we're gonna talk about rolling up your sleeves. Rolling up your sleeves. We're looking at how do we bring a dream and a hope and a vision to reality. We're in this time, you know, uh, coming out of the pandemic, and I know the world is still in it, but we're starting to see life emerge in a different way. And the question we're asking is, how do we emerge better? How do we emerge stronger? How do we not just kind of try to go back or, or do things just a little different? How do we really say, in my life, in my family, as a church, in my business, in my world, how do I really make some changes, and how do I go in a new direction, emerging better and stronger? So we've been talking about that over the last several weeks. If you remember, or if you're new here, I want to help you onboard a little bit. We're following a man named, what's his name? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Good job. We're in Nehemiah. We're going to be in it for a few more weeks. And Nehemiah was, uh, was a man who was a cupbearer to a king who lived about 1,000 miles. He lived about 1,000 miles away from his homeland, which was, uh, in, in Jer was Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. And the city had been destroyed 150 years earlier earlier, and about 100 years ago, some of his uh, ancestors started resettling the land. They rebuilt the temple, but the city walls remained torn down, and they were a disgrace, and when Nehemiah heard about it, we talked about it in the first week, he was just overcome with emotion. He wept about it, and he prayed to God about it. How can this be? It wasn't just that city walls were broken down. This was a, a spiritual thing. It was a disgrace. This was the, the city of, of the, the one true God. And the people were to be representatives to the world, to be a blessing to the world. How can we leave these walls broken down? And yet they were for 100 years. This is what we talked about in week one. We said, look, that brokenness births vision. When you get sick and tired of what's broken in your life, when you finally come to a place that says it's time for something new, you take a step forward. And that brokenness can birth something wonderful. Then we talked about how do we clarify that vision. You can't just have a, a vision or an idea, the problem. You have to go to a place of saying, what's it gonna look like different? Remember the four steps to clarifying the vision that we talked about last week? Come on, this is a pop quiz here, right? What's the first thing you gotta do? Identify the problem. What's wrong? You gotta be real with it. Why is it a problem? It's gotta be addressed. Then what do you come up with? The solution, right? Pretty straightforward. What do you see as the end result? Where do you wanna get to? What needs to change? What do you need after that? A plan, you guys are A students, all right. You get a plan together, you put a couple steps together, what do I need to do? But then comes the critical part for four, which is what? Action, right, you gotta begin to move on it. Good job, you guys, I love it, I love it. I, that makes me feel really good. Um, but hopefully it's more than just talking about it, we wanna make these changes in our lives. 
And so now comes the point, as we followed Nehemiah, he was now making his way. He went to the king. He got letters from the king for safe passage, for lumber from the king's forest. And now he had arrived in Jerusalem is where we left it off last week. And so again, today we're going to talk about rolling up our sleeves and getting to work. Now, this has been driving me crazy. I just did this for powerful effect here today. I never leave my sleeves down. If you guys have noticed over four years, I can't stand it because you know what you got to do? You got to get to work. I'm working today. I'm working here, people. Anyone else want to roll their sleeves up? Who's ready to roll their sleeves up? Come on, roll your sleeves up. Just do it. it, it, it it's just something about like getting into that. You get into it, right? You know it's time to go. It's time to go. Push them up. Come on. You ready to go? We're going to go. All right, here we go. We're going to go in Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to pick up where we left off. The city officials, it says this. Nehemiah, remember, he went, and he went to the city, and he arrived, and at, in the night, I forgot to mention this, we talked about last week, he went at night, and he began to inspect the city walls that were broken down. And he went all the way around and he took a deeper, closer look at it. And he said this, the city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administrations. administration. Why, why did he not say anything? See, some of us, we get a vision, we get a plan, and all of a sudden we're just telling everybody, but you haven't thought it through. You don't have a plan. You don't have an idea of what you're doing, and it may never happen. Nehemiah understood it takes some time to, to birth this vision, to think about it, and to, to really let it sink in. Here's what I want to say. Don't go public with your plans until you have thought it through and are ready to follow through. That's two different things, Right? Don't go public until you've thought it through and followed through, whether it's a personal plan that you have, a vision, or something you see at work or at school. Think it through, internalize it, and then really focus in, all right, what are we going to do? And that's what Nehemiah did. He spent, remember, he heard about it in the walls. He spent four months praying and fasting, didn't talk to anybody. Then he finally had the courage, and he spoke to the king, and, and amazing things began to unfold. And then he spent another several months, I think it was about five months from just that time to getting ready to go, to making the journey, to getting to Jerusalem. So about nine months into this, and now something shifts. He's been quiet, he's been processing it. And look at the first two words of this next verse, verse 17. But now, but now. I mean, imagine, right? I mean, if you think about nine months. Is there anything else that takes nine months to develop that before it? I don't know, it's, it's, it seems to be a significant amount of time. But in that amount of time, right, there comes a point in time where you're saying, and now, but now is the time. It's time to go public, it's time to share what God's been doing. I cannot do this alone, I need others. And he recognizes this. But now I said to them, who's he talking to? The priests, the nobles, the officials, the leaders, right? The ones who can make things happen, the ones that represent the people. Here's what he said. You know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Okay, Captain Obvious, right? I mean, here, but he, what, he starts again with a problem that's seen to everybody. Everyone has known this and he doesn't act like he's sharing something new with them. You know what trouble we are in. You know how the city is vulnerable. You know how this is a disgrace to others. You know how it's been a been hundred years that we've been back here and no, no one has done anything. You know this. So he begins, by again, by sharing the problem. What's the problem? He's letting them know. And then he makes this shift. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. You see, he gets to the point in time where he's like, all right, it's time to go public. It's time to share this. It's time to invite others. And I'm gonna address what the problem is. It's obvious. You see it all around you. And so now let me call you to action. We've got to do something about this. They've been witness to this. Now is the time to do something. The best visions, God-sized visions, are bigger than any one man or woman can accomplish alone. Think about that. The things that we need to do, the things that we're called to together, it's the picture of the church. It's the mission that Jesus gave us is that, that no one can ever accomplish it alone. Even Jesus himself did not attempt to accomplish the mission alone. When he, when he came, who did he enlist? Some disciples, right? He brought some around him, and he said he wanted to pass that on. And he shared with them the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples. That was a mission they couldn't accomplish by themselves. So they understood, we need to make more disciples. And it's a mission that's been handed to us to say, there's something bigger. Let's rebuild. Let's do this together. Jesus understood it. And it's the foundation for the church, for a mission that is beyond us, something that we can be involved in. 
And listen, while we may not accomplish a vision alone, and Nehemiah realized this, God's vision needs a champion. God's vision needs a champion. Now, before we think about some grandiose uh, visions, think about your own life. This is true for you. We've been talking about your, your, your family life, thinking about your marriage, thinking about your career, think about your finances, your health. God's vision needs a champion, and it begins with you. You wanna make a change in your life? You've gotta champion it, right? God's speaking in your heart that it's time to step out. You can't wait for others to make the change for you. You can't wait for your kids to make your family a better place, right? Your kids aren't gonna make your marriage better. You've gotta be the champion for the vision that God's placed in your heart for your life. Maybe you need to champion something at work. Maybe you need to champion something right here at, at church. Maybe in school, you need to champion something in, for your class. But God's vision always takes a champion. He works through people. He works through you and me. And you can be the champion that speaks out. And when the champion speaks out, when the one that takes on the cost that speaks out, you'd be surprised how many times other people will say, you know what, I agree, we need to do something. I've just been waiting for somebody. Or you're speaking a vision that they've already been having or thinking about, but you're the one with the courage to step out. And that's exactly what happens here. Nehemiah steps out. He's the champion for it, but then comes this clear call to action. Look, a clear vision calls for a clear call to action. For Nehemiah, it's, straight, it's straightforward. Let's rebuild the wall, right? The wall's broken down, let's rebuild it. Let's come together, let us end this disgrace once and for all. Let's do this. I think about it as the all call to the wall. Right? This was the moment, an all call to the wall, calling all people, we're going to the wall, let's do this together. So now comes the question, here's this moment. He's riding, he, you know, he, he's talking to them, he's cheering them on, and this is a scary moment when you're a leader, or when you step out and you verbalize something that's going on, or maybe you say to somebody, I'm gonna change my career path. You know, I'm gonna take a new major, or, or, or we're gonna work on our marriage. Whenever you put yourself out there, it's kind of a scary moment, how are people gonna respond? I mean, imagine William Wallace riding back and forth, you know, in Braveheart, you know, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. And they're like, yeah, you're right, never mind, I'm going home. You know, and all the men took, turned their horses around, right? But it's a moment where you're going, okay, now what? How do we respond? And so how did the people respond? Verse 18, they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. It's a pivot point here. After 100 years, think about that. After 100 years, the work began. They began. And I think about this as the power of our yes. When we are invited, when somebody shares something with us to invite us into a vision, or whether, again, you're doing that for somebody else, you're going, the power of a yes is amazing. When people not only commit, but then follow through, right? They said, yes, let's rebuild it. And then what does the next phrase say? And they began working on the wall, right? They began the good work. This is where things shift. This is where the sleeves get rolled up. This is where work now begins. The theory, the idea, the vision now actually has to, has to have some work that is done to it. But I don't wanna miss this next little section here. I'm just gonna tell you about it, but as soon as Nehemiah shares this vision, I don't think it's coincidence that the very next section, after these guys say, let's begin the good work, the next section talks about some opposition that he faced. Sanballat, Tobiah, a couple other guys. These guys were governors of areas in the surrounding regions, and they felt threatened. And whenever you shake things up, whenever you cast a vision, whenever you wanna break the status quo, it's gonna upset some people because the status quo leaves some comfortable. And some don't want that and want, don't want the difference and, and, and they're gonna step and create opposition and, and Nehemiah faced it. And we're gonna talk some more about this next week when we talk about opposition as it hits even stronger as they're rebuilding the wall. But here's the thing, Nehemiah steps forward and he says, you know what? God is gonna help us and we are moving forward. Remember, the follow through. Not just come up with a plan, but to follow it through. And you know what he says to them? He says, you're not gonna have any part in this. If you're not gonna be a part of it, you're not gonna have any part in this. And that's a sad thing, that's a sad reality, but he's calling those now to say, let's do this, let's get involved. And so now it's time to start building, right? He's got the naysayers, but he's gonna focus on those, the people that he has. Now we move into chapter three. Again, it's the all call to the wall here. With every vision, there comes the pivotal moment to roll up your sleeves and get to work. And this is that moment. We've talked about it, we've had the plan, we've got the vision, and now it's time to do it. How do they respond? I'm only gonna read to you the first verse of chapter three, and it starts like this. Then Eli Eliashib, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the sheep gate. 
So that's how it begins. It talks about the priest rebuilding at the sheep gate. And then about 19 other times in that passage, it says, and next to him, and next to them, and next to them. And in total, it ultimately lists about 40 family names or names of individuals or people groups that got involved in the rebuilding of this wall. And we see this amazing picture emerge of this, these people working together, all hands on deck. The stones that they were tripping over for how many years, right, that, they were, that, 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 that were there, all of a sudden now, things are starting to happen. Things are starting to move. Instead of pointing a finger like they did for a lot of years, look, 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 they lifted a hand. Instead of pointing the finger, they lifted a hand. Some of us need to take that home with us right now. Some of us have been pointing fingers, maybe whether it's here or maybe it's at home or whether it's somebody else's vision, and, and instead of pointing a finger, let's lift a hand and watch what happens when they begin to get involved and, and, and work together in this. So let's start for a second here with the significance of, of the high priests building at the Sheep Gate. You guys know what the Sheep Gate was? What do you think went through the Sheep Gate? Just one, one I'll give you one guess. <laughs> yeah, sheep, right? So it's a Sheep Gate because sheep came through the gate, but why? Because that was the sacrifices. That was the gate where the sacrifices were brought into the temple, not only sheep, but other things. And so this represented a spiritual gateway. So the wall represented more than just physical protection. It was a spiritual symbol as well. And the sheep gate was key, and he began at the sheep gate. And you know who it began with? It began with the priests. It began with the spiritual leaders. We may picture the priests, especially in the Old Testament, with all the rituals and the temple and, and maybe in their garb and all the, you know, the, just kind of maybe looking stiff and, and, and formal and trying to do that. They were the ones that were first on the wall. They are the ones who rolled up their sleeves and said, let's do this. They modeled, they, they gave the example. And they went to the wall and started rebuilding. And it was a way of saying, not only is it the sheep gate, but we commit ourselves the first sacrifice we give and we bring and we do it. And so the rebuilding began from that point at the sheep gate. But then it says again, all throughout the next 40 sections of the wall until it goes all the way around, they listed again all these other family names. But it also said some of who they were. So we began with the priests, but we had nobles. We had city directors and leaders from different districts. People who you might say, well, you know, why would they get involved in the work? They have other more important things. No, they rolled up their sleeves and they got in there. It talked about people in neighboring towns and villages, people that didn't even live within the city, but they understood that we are a part of this. Whether or not we're inside the wall, we wanna help do that, and they did. And then it lists specifically some trades. Some, well, it says there were some goldsmiths that helped. Well, goldsmiths were artisans. They were making fine crafts. They were you know, maybe hammering out cool designs and whatnot. What are they doing working on the wall? I mean, this is rough you know, work to lay stone and, and brick and, and cut timber, but they did it. You know who else was on the wall? Perfume makers, it says. I don't know why they were singled out. But perfume makers, you're going, what are they doing on the wall? No, they did their part. They rolled up their sleeves. They got on the wall. They made it smell really good. It was important, okay? <laughs> it talks about the merchants that were there and, and business owners. Now, these people had other day jobs, right? I mean, everyone here, they were either farmers or, or they were selling things. They were making things. The business leaders, they were there too, the merchants, serving, building, and doing things. I do want to give a special shout out in verse, uh, verse 12 if you have it in front of you. His name is Shalom. You know why I want to give him a special shout out? It says, Shalom went to work on the wall, Shalom and his daughters. I could relate to Shalom with my four daughters, all right? It wasn't like, you know, oh, Shalom, sorry. Um, well, maybe your girls can go fetch some water for the, for the men working. No, Shalom's like, you know what? We're here, my girls, on the wall, now we got this. Ladies, let's get to work. They were all sitting there in the first service for me, and now, you know what, they've rolled up their sleeves, and they're in park kids, and they're serving, and Kira's back there on the camera, hiding her head, um, operating the camera, right? <laughs> we're a part of this. We roll up our sleeves, we begin, but so Shalom, shout out to Shalom, and anyone else here with all daughters, Yonkmans, yeah, way to go, all right. We're in this, all right? We wanna stand in the gap. Right? This is what it is, shoulder to shoulder, standing in the gap. The wall that was broken down had lots of gaps, openings, and, and things that were broken down, ineffective as a wall. Forty sections identified from the sheep gate worked its way all the way around. I love how the plan encircled the whole city. It was like, we, we can't just build 90% of the wall. How effective is 90% of the wall? It's not going to keep everyone out, so he's gonna, they're going to build the wall completely around. And so they're, they're doing this work, and they're, they're getting in this, and everyone is taking this section shoulder to shoulder. Do you ever play the game uh, Red Rover, Red Rover? 
Remember that? I don't know if they're still, you're, okay, I see you're, 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 some younger folks too also play, doing this. So Red Rover, Red Rover, you hold hands, right? You form a line and you're like, you lock arms really good and then you form opposite uh, another team and you say what? Red Rover, Red Rover, send Clay over. No, I wouldn't send Clay over. Clay would probably break through the wall there. Clay Hattie, sorry. But you know, you call somebody over, but now that's the challenge, right? Clay's gonna try to run through. He's gonna try to break the, the bond that we have. What happens when he doesn't break through? Ah, he now joins us, and now he stands in the gap. Now he comes together, and it's the strength saying, we can't just leave open spots, and you remember ever those things, you had a big guy or somebody running at you, and then you're like, ah, you let go, right? No, you gotta stand in the gap, you gotta hold on, and that's what these guys did. And it said some of them took a section that was close to their home, a section of the wall that mattered to them, maybe that they had a specific interest in. If you're living right there, that that upped the motivation for them, and they got involved. I love the way Matthew Henry put it, he's, he uh, writes some commentaries and he said this, if everyone will sweep before his own door, the street will be clean. If everyone does their part, if everyone sweeps in front of their own door, the street will be clean. If everyone in your neighborhood cuts their grass and at least has their front yard looking fairly decent, your whole street is clean, right? Don't be that one neighbor. This is a public service announcement. Don't be the one neighbor that the HOA and everybody complains about, okay? Take care of your yard. If everyone sweeps in front of their own house, the whole street will be clean. But listen, let's step back here. Here's the key. Here's one of the key things I want you to take away from today. When we are part of something bigger than ourselves, we find ourselves. When we are part of something bigger than ourselves, we find ourselves. What do we find? We find our community, our identity, our community, and our purpose. And so this is a call for us. When we just are only about our own thing, we, we shrink. But when we get part of something bigger than ourselves, man, we begin to find ourselves just picture the scene. It's been 100 years in this brokenness of these walls, and on that first day after that, with everyone with their assignments, imagine the sun coming up, the roosters crowing, and already you start hearing the first scuttle about the walls in the city. And pretty soon, you're hearing chisels and stone and the clanking that's going on. You're hearing saws that are working. You're hearing horses hauling things around. You're seeing mortar going up, bricks being hauled. You see some people singing. Some are cheering. Some are just, just uh, having a good time talking. Somebody's bringing coffee, right? I mean, it's just, there's a buzz. There's an excitement about it. When we're part of something together, all of a sudden the city that's been laying in ruins now, people everywhere, no matter where you go, there's somebody working and building and doing it. We are in this together. I mean, how awesome is that? That's when you, you see, I'm a part of something bigger than just myself, and I think the people of God in that city began to experience that. Let's all do a part and do something with that. And when we work together, when we start building, when we actually roll up our sleeves and get going in there, you know what that does? It creates ownership. If you've ever worked on anything or in anything, it creates ownership. If you left some blood, sweat, and tears in a project or in a building assignment or in a ministry or a challenge at work, you have ownership of that. I remember uh, years ago when I was in college, a couple summers, I worked for Holtz Homes, Wally Holtz was the owner, he was my, my best friend's dad, and he had a general contracting company, and so he gave me a job a couple summers, and uh, you know what my job was? It was peon, <laughs> right? It was low man on totem pole. You come and go, and you know what? Hey, Mark, here's our order for everyone's coffee and donuts. Make the donut run, right? Go and hold the cabinets. I was a cabinet holder. I was the floor sweeper. I was the shingle supplier. I was the ditch digger. You know, whatever was needed, I did it. Occasionally, I got to actually use the saw and cut some things and drill some holes, right? But I got to be a part of it. And when we finished those projects, and, his, and, and Wally always had such a high standard of craftsmanship. You can't do that. He's, he's German. You got to have high quality of standards when you're doing that. And so, so he, um, we would build these amazing remodels and, and homes and different things. And even I got to step back on that when we were done and look at it and say, I got to have a part in that. I mean, what did I do? I swept the broom. I got to clean, clean up afterward. But but I had a part in it. I felt different towards this house than I did another one, because why? Because I worked in it, because I did something for it. I had ownership in that, and so it is with the things that we are called to. This is what happens when we're a part of the church, when we're a part of a mission. When we give ourselves to something bigger than ourselves, we find ourselves, we find our identity, we find our community, we find our purpose. This uh, time of the year uh, always marks um, a milestone for me, and I'm sure you have different times of the year like that for you, and, and, and one of the things about the time right now around of end of April, end of March, end of April, was the time where we were making our final decision whether or not to come to Meadow Park four years ago. 
And so um, it was four years ago, it was actually the end of March, I was making my last trip back here. I had already met with the search team several times. Um, the interest was expressed for us to consider coming here, but I still had some things I wanted to process, and so I said, let's come one more trip. I wanna talk to with the board and the staff as well this time. And so um, I was flying out here, and I was writing in my journal, and so I came across this, and I wanna read to you just some thoughts that I had as I was coming. And I normally don't share um, from my, my journal because it's none of your business, um, <laughs> but I was looking back, and I do this periodically. I go back through and, and just kind of remember the story, some of the highs, the lows, different things, and this is what I was writing while I was on the plane uh, coming to Columbus. What a crazy journey this is. I'm on my way back to Columbus to meet with Meadow Park's board and staff. This is our final look and engagement, and then we will give them a final answer. These past two weeks, Shannon and I have a growing peace and unity about moving to Columbus and leading MPC. Some doubts still linger. Are they truly willing to change, progress, innovate, and do whatever it takes to reach the next generation and the unchurched? Will they change their governance structure to become more swift and agile and empowering to the pastor and leaders? This is what I wanna to talk to the board about. My passion is to reach people far from God to do whatever it takes to break down the walls of the church and any barriers but the cross. I wanna surprise those far from God with the goodness of God's grace and the power and passion of his church. I see first through the eyes of an unchurched person. What do they see and feel and experience when they encounter the church? In the community and on Sunday in worship, through our building, online, with our kids and youth ministry. An entire generation is dismissing the church in mass. Does MPC want to be a trailblazer on the front lines of the kingdom's pursuit of the lost? It will cost us something. Sacrifice always does. The sacrifice will come in form, structure, methods, and comfort, and predictability, but never the truth and power of the gospel. The reward will come through new faces, changed lives, baptisms, emerging leaders, community and global impact, a church alive and thriving in this generation. This is our responsibility and calling. The time is now. That was four years ago. That was what God was stirring in my heart as I'm on a plane coming here going, is this the future? Is this the place? Is this what Meadow Park longs for? And the answer to me was yes. The answer was yes as I talked with the board, as I talked with the staff, and we were invited back and we had our candidating Sunday we came out and we shared our heart and passion. And that phrase, whatever it takes, I didn't even realize it was in my journal when I wrote that message. It wasn't until a year or two later that I realized I had written that in there. But that was the phrase. I was teaching that day. I remember if you guys were here, we said, we gotta do what? <laughs> whatever it takes. And that's a big line and that's a hard thing to say, but what is all attached to that? And there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of sacrifice that comes with that. And we've had to persevere through lots of different things but God is moving, and that was the answer, and we said, let's do this together. There was a commitment there, and there was a, an opportunity to link arms, and God has walked with us through this time. I just wanna give you three things as I close out here about standing in the gap. What does it mean for you and me? What do I see here to stand in the gap in this all call to the wall? The first part is this, show up. You can't fill a gap you're not standing in. You gotta show up. You know what the first gap is? The first gap is sitting right here. I know some of you are watching online and I love that we have the opportunity to watch online and it's a great way for us to communicate, but I'm telling you, you need to get here. You need to be here. And I know that we have a different uh, view and things have been changing, you know, church once in a while, maybe here, maybe there, we have opportunities. You have a huge gap that is not filled when you are not here. That's a lot of negatives. Fill the seat. <laughs> Get in here, why? What does it matter? You know what, what happens, again, what happens if everyone decides I'm not gonna come, I'm not gonna show up? I mean, I've preached to an empty room, <laughs> to the cameras and whatnot, it's not the same. There's something powerful about when we come together, when I hear you in worship, when you bring your part, when you bring your smile, even under a mask, when you give an air high five, when you talk to somebody, when you stop and pray with somebody. Showing up is huge. You can't fill the gap if you don't show up. Don't be one of those once a monthers twice a years, every other weekers. Make a commitment today, say I am here every single Sunday come H-E double hockey sticks or high water. That's the only phrase that comes to mind right now. <laughs> and you better be here if it comes. <laughs> it's appropriate to use this phrase, by the way. <laughs> because listen, 
This is the community, and you can't fill the gap if you're not here. And so the biggest part of the battle already is coming together, the worship, the time, what God is doing in us is, is so awesome. So I'm so thankful for you joining in, and especially this year we've been challenged. And I still know some of us aren't ready to come back, and there's still health issues, so I obviously have grace and, and want to share that. But we are connected. We are joining together. So show up. The second part of standing in the gap, own your section of the wall. Claim your section of the wall. I'm not asking you to rebuild the whole wall. Nobody's asking you to take on the whole wall. I can't rebuild the whole wall. I have one section. What's your section of the wall? They circled the city. No gaps. Every one of us, no gaps. Don't let there be a gap where you are. Some took a section closest to their home, something that was important to them, something that they related to and had extra motivation for. Whatever it is, show up. Whether you make perfume or you have daughters, <laughs> whether you're a goldsmith or whatever it is, we need you on the wall. If the story is written about Meadow Park in this time, if there was a book like this, if there was a chapter three for Meadow Park, whose names would be written in that? What family's names would be listed there? I hope that it would say there was Mark, son of Helmut, and his four daughters, and they showed up on the wall. There were the McDaniels, leaders of worship, who took another section of the wall. Right? Then there were, were, the, were the Keatings, masters of technology, <laughs> and they took their part on the wall. There's been keep going through and saying, we took this section. This was our part. This was my role, and we're going to lead our people. We're going to lead our family to that. Show up. Own your section of the wall. And the third part here, the standing in the gap, is roll up your sleeves and get dirty. We have way too many clean Christians when it comes to the mission of Christ. Way too many clean Christians who say, you know what, I just want to go to church, I want to go on with my life, I want to get a good sermon, pastor, and I sure hope that music is good, and I, hope, I sure hope they took care of my kids well, and then I ho sure hope that youth ministry does something good for my kids, and I sure hope the church does some missions and good stuff in the, in the community. I may even give you a couple bucks now and then, but that's all I want. That's not standing in the gap. Standing in the gap is showing up. It's taking your section of the wall, rolling up your sleeves, and getting dirty. And sometimes getting dirty literally means getting dirty. <laughs> Daryl Hardy was just telling me about how dirty he got when he cut the grass out there with our lawn crew and some of those guys that take care of that, right? You're covered in grass. You might literally get dirty cleaning up, doing something. But getting dirty might mean preparing like the band does when they, they're here on Wednesday nights. They've rehearsed beforehand, getting their parts ready. Then they come together. They spend hours getting ready to come here. Teachers preparing lesson plans for the kids, cutting things out, preparing you know, their thoughts. Our student ministry, what are we gonna talk about with our teams and planning trips? Hosts that are being scheduled, that are coming early, what's happening in the service? I, this morning I came, there was nothing on the table and I prayed to God and I said, Lord, somehow make bread and the cup appear. No, literally somebody had to go and the Goldings had to go and they buy the bread and to pour the cup and to clean it up. It's the little things, so many things we don't see all around us, buttons that are being turned, you know, images that are being made. Hundreds of people involved, standing in the gap, rolling up their sleeves, feeling ownership in this, a part in this. That's what it means to get dirty. And you know what else you gotta get dirty? Your checkbook. I know none of you guys have checkbooks anymore, right? You gotta get your computer dirty and go to meadowpark.org forward slash give. <laughs> I don't know how to get that dirty, but listen, it's a financial standing in the gap. When these people committed to going on, uh, on the wall, they had to sacrifice some of their livelihood for what they were normally doing and working in, in their other businesses. They were bringing supplies, they were bringing their time and their talent and their treasure, it wasn't just a couple bucks. It's like, let's be a part of this. Meadow Park doesn't just have a budget out there, it's ours, that's it, that's it. It comes from, from each of every one of us. We don't all have the same amount, but we should be making sacrifice and giving, and God has called us to that. And when we do, we get to be a part of all the amazing things that God is doing. And it's just an invitation that says, come on, let's be a part of it. Be a part of what God is doing. Well, when we're a part of something bigger than ourselves, we find ourselves. And when we stand in the gap, we find a sense of responsibility and we find a sense of joy, and we find a sense of purpose in saying, God, thank you that we get to be a part of what you're doing. And God has been moving and stirring, and I love that we get to share in this journey together. When I think about standing in the gap, and even on this day as we, as we wanna take some time with communion, and if you're at home, maybe just have a, a cup of, of juice or water or wine and some bread, we're gonna share in communion together. Because we can't talk about standing in the gap without understanding why we stand in the gap, and that's because Jesus Christ stood in the gap for us. 
While he knew he didn't leave this mission just to himself, there was one place only he could stand, and that was on the cross. The sinless, spotless lamb of God. He rolled up his sleeves, stepped out of heaven. He didn't just say, oh, I'm too good for this, I don't wanna go, to no. He came and he gave up his life to stand in the gap so that we could have our life, that he would die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, for the hope, for the freedom, and for the joy that we can share that with others. And when Jesus was with his disciples, he used this symbol of bread and the cup as a way to symbolize the unity of the body that we are all part of this one bread, which is the body of Christ, and he took it and he broke it, and he gave thanks. If you take out your communion now here, you take the bread. Let's take it and eat together. This is Christ's body broken for us. Then he took the cup. He said, this cup represents a new day, a new covenant. My blood spilled out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And when we take this, we give thanks to God. Let's take and drink together. Heavenly Father, as we remember your amazing sacrifice, that you stepped out of heaven, God, that you had a plan for us, you saw the problem of sin. And the solution was, God, that you would come, that you would give your life, and your plan was to go all the way to the cross. And Father, you took the action to step out of heaven and to die for us, to take our place on that cross. And so, God, we are just so humbled. We are thankful. How can we ever say thanks enough? You gave your life. And Father, we give you ours. And Father, it's not just us as individuals, God. This is community. We are commune, community together, taking communion. So Father, may we be the church. May we be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, after Jesus gave up his life and then went to the cross, and then he died and rose again, when he gathered his disciples together, right, he gave them this great commission and he said, go into all the world and make disciples. Go, now do. I've given you an example. I'm gonna stand in the gap. Now you go and do that for others. Go stand in the gap. Go accomplish the mission and the vision God has set out for you. When I think about our church, when I think about Meadow Park, when I picture it, when I, in, in my mind, what brought me here four years ago, what I still see and we're seeing glimpses and, and realities of this more and more, but I see just the church alive in worship a church where you show up here on a Sunday morning and you can already feel it out in the parking lot because there's about 10 of you out there just greeting people and waving them in saying, we're so glad you're here. You're out in the lobby, you're just excited to connect with people. You come in here, there's, there's, a, there's a buzz because God's doing something. There's an excitement, a readiness for what's gonna happen. And we worship and we, we just celebrate and we sing it out and we turn to God's word and we're got dialed in, we're listening, we're taking notes, we're going, okay, what do I gotta do in my life? God, how are you changing me? When the kids are being dropped off in the area, there's some of you standing in the gap saying, I wanna help these kids know Christ. I want them to experience the love of Christ. I'm gonna prepare, I'm gonna bring my best, I'm gonna be ready. This is gonna be the best hour of their kids' week is here, not at school, not on their tablet, not anywhere else, it's gonna be here at church. And when our students and teenagers come, we're gonna give them a time to connect and to get to know somebody and adults who care for them who are gonna walk alongside them. We're gonna help deal with issues that they're dealing with. We're gonna create fun opportunities and activities. We're gonna go on trips. We're gonna give them experiences to come, to grow together, to know Christ. We're gonna to reach together. We're gonna to, to serve. We're gonna work. We're gonna be involved in missions and outreach and helping our community and, and make change right here in our city. We're gonna sacrifice. We're gonna give. We're, we're, we're gonna go come back to you guys. Guys, you keep blowing us away. The, the, the money's coming in more than, than we've even budgeted for. Who do we wanna bless this week? What do we wanna do with it now? You guys are just blowing us away. Come on. This is the kind of church I see where the gaps are filled, where you're sitting here on a Sunday morning bringing a friend, and you're nervous, and you're going, oh, Mark, don't screw this up. I only got one shot, Mark, don't screw this up, don't embarrass me, and I'm sorry if I embarrassed you today, but listen, right? We bring our best, we roll up our sleeves, we get to work, because we're a part of this mission. And I want every one of us to be proud to say, you know what, I am Meadow Park. I am Meadow Park Church, but you know, more than that, we are Christ followers, and we're part of a much bigger vision than Meadow Park Church that Christ has called us to, and that is our joy, and that is our blessing. 
God's given us his promise and he is faithful to fulfill it. Nothing will stop it. If we don't get on board with it, he's gonna find somebody else. So let's be the ones that take the mantle and that go. Would you stand in the gap and roll up your sleeves?